listeners. I am your host, David Reed, president of the Ontario Real Estate Association, and you're listening to the Real Estate Edition, which airs the second Tuesday of every month. And as we approach the end of 2018, I thought it would be a great to do something a little different on the podcast for the month of December. So today we're going to talk about five real estate stories of 2018. And these top five topics that we're going to discuss really kind of highlight the year that we had in real estate. And I'm really excited today. We have two very special guests who are here to chat with me about these changes. And today we have Sheila Botting, who is a senior partner and Canadian real estate leader at Deloitte. And Richard Silver, who is a global real estate advisor at Sotheby's International Realty. And he leads Silver, Burtnick and Associates at Sotheby's. So Richard and Sheila, a hearty welcome to you both. Thank Thank you you for being here today. Thank you. Thank you. So what we're going to do, we're going to talk about each topic, hopefully maybe five, six minutes. We're going, to, sure. we're going to jump right in if that's okay. So the first topic, which is top of mind for us at our provincial association, is housing affordability. And 2018, it was more of the same. People really struggled to, to afford homes. And uh, we saw home ownerships, uh, home ownership rates drop for the first time ever which is kind of alarming. So Aria's response, we came up with a Keep the Dream Alive campaign, which is a great campaign and we're very proud of. And we, we during the provincial and municipal elections, we put pressure on candidates to, to really work to make home ownership affordable. And we succeeded. You know, and, and not very recently in the Ontario government's fall economic summit statement, uh, Vic Fidelli, the finance minister, he announced the housing supply action plan. And this is their commitment to develop a strategy to increasing housing supply, supply quickly and responsibly. So what, what I'd like to know is, I'm going to ask you, Richard, start with you, what are your thoughts? Uh, what are your thoughts on this announcement? I, I think it's a great idea. The only issue, I think, is it's still not going to be enough uh, for the number of people who are coming to live in, certainly in the GTA. we have getting so many um, additional uh, immigrants or immig- immigration, net immigration, and I think it still won't be enough to keep up to uh, the levels that we've getting. We're, we're, we are in the GTA very, very uh, busy with a lot of great business opportunities coming, a lot of great job opportunities, and sadly a lot of the other provinces are suffering. So we're getting a lot of immigration from the West and uh, from, the, from, the, um, from the Atlantic as well, and I think uh, there's, a g- there's g- still going to be a lot of pressure. Mm, now, now, Sheila, I know you do an awful lot of work in the commercial space, but any comments you want to add to that? Uh, oh, of course. When you think about Toronto and certainly the large Canadian cities, they're among the best cities in, in the world. And Toronto, as we become more global, more people are attracted. It says about 150,000 people, mm. I believe, to this area every year. Yeah. That's a big number to accommodate. Mm-hmm. So then you start thinking about affordability. You look at the balance between supply and demand. And here in Southern Ontario, with um, you know, with the cap on new supply, we've got our green belt, a choice that we made to make sure that we've got green spaces. Suddenly you're building within that envelope overall for Southern Ontario. So as soon as there's a restriction, of course, pricing is going to go way up. So the challenge is really about creating new supply, whether that's rental supply or ownership supply. And how do you create enough supply to be able to accommodate the you know requirements from the population? Um, our development community is very sophisticated. They can build product as much as we possibly would let them. So making sure they've got available land and the incentive to build is probably one of the most important um, opportunities. In fact, it was just today that the province announced that they would release some of their surplus property, some 243 surplus properties. It's about 14,000 acres so that you could create affordable housing on those properties. So again, once you create the incentive for supply and create the land available, the development community very well served to go and create that's great and that's an exciting announcement appreciate you bringing that to our our attention but when land is you know when we talk a lot about um, some of the residential properties does it impact how does it impact on the commercial real estate world Mm. so if you think about commercial there's the two really big parts that matter today the industrial base right now we bought 800 million square feet in southern ontario it's the third largest industrial market in north america that's huge so now we're restricting land development it's really tight our vacancy rates are down to the you know two three four percent range in the industrial supply world so again creating land available for industrial is really important well, that's, uh, Richard, uh, yep. for you now, what, what does affordability mean from the perspective of a, of a real estate professional? It means the bank of mom and dad is even more important than it's ever been. <laughs> yes. 
Um, it's strangely, you know, I, we deal with this a lot. We're we're very lucky. We have a lot of people who, uh, you know, come to us uh, new new buyers, and they've got a lot of money from the family. Uh, because the um, you know the previous generation has been fairly well healed and they've done some things and they've got investment they've got a property and so they depend a lot on their parents and uh, but you know what strangely enough my parents uh, my own parents bought back in the 50s and it's the same thing they got money from my grandmother so uh, that still happens but even more so it's uh, bank of mom and dad and it is definitely um, looking at options. I, I think there's a big pressure right now. Uh, you get in your car and you start driving and you decide how far out of town you can go to buy something that's affordable so that you can do the commute back and forth. And, you know, I think more and more you're going to, because of traffic, you're going to see pressure to get a little bit less within the city limits or get it closer to where you're working. And I think that's all of that's going to be a big balance. Used to be, you know, 10, 15 years ago, you lived downtown, you started having f kids, you went out to Mississauga, but now that 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 drive is, you know, you know, very difficult to do every day, and it takes you two and two and a half hours, three hours away from your family, which is, you know, gets basically, uh, you know, is against what we would like to see. Can I pick no. up on that? You yeah. certainly so can. So if you think sure. about, like, we talk about land development, right? You think about the core of the city of Toronto and then the concentric rings outside of the city of Toronto. Union Station becomes then the core to everything and the transportation networks, you know, the spine of our wheel into Union Station, it becomes about how far can you commute every day? How, mm -hmm. What does that absolutely look like? And so the way that technology is changing, you can almost work anywhere, anytime, any place. So proximity doesn't necessarily matter because now I can commute from Hamilton or Niagara every day. And with Metrolinx's new investment in RER transportation, it allows you to kind of move further than the city proper. And I think that's something really important to pay attention to. You know, Collingwood, Niagara, you know, down in Prince Edward County, all becoming very attractive locations for people in terms of the live uh, work quality. Quality, life balance. No, I'll even throw Muskoka into the mix. <laughs> I must say, go. I have to. There you go. But uh, great points. Thank you very much. So that's our first topic, and it's such an important one. Keep, you know, as we talk about our Keep the Dream Alive campaign and housing affordability. But moving on, our, our second topic, we're going to deal, touch base on um, interest rate increases. So, sure. um, 2018, the Bank of Canada saw three increases in the last hike. In October, saw rates go up by 1.5 percent, and that hasn't happened since December of. Uh, 2008 so simply put it just means it costs you more to borrow um, and the end of 2020 economists expect at least three more rate increases that take the rate up to two and a half percent but uh, last year we had a lot of talk a lot of chat around OSFI and the stress test and, and mm -hmm. the impact that was felt so what uh, what will this mean for business and for new buyers in particular uh, in the new uh, Richard give you a well, start certainly on this certainly in residential it meant that people could not afford what they were looking at before as soon as we had that uh, you know the the stress test people uh, you know picked up the phone called you and said you know what I don't approve for the mortgage that I approve for so now we have to shift we have to downsize a bit in our in our in our dreams um, but you know what I I don't I'm not really much against it because there were a lot of people I remember from years ago who did overcommit and uh, I lived through that and I saw a lot of people who were having major problems uh, ma managing their uh, their mortgages and it's not a pretty sight and so I don't really mind the stress test that much, and I think maybe we have to readjust our, our, uh, what we're looking at, and we have to have more options. And some of those options may just be, you know, more options in rentals. Yeah, no, you absolutely. Know? And you Sheila, know? with respect to the interest rates, what impact in terms of the commercial? I mean, it's a different animal. Yeah. We're, we live in residential all the time, and it's, and, and it's, but I just, can you comment on interest rates and how it impacts? Sure. The, commercial space? Sure. So if you think of the commercial investor, typically they may be either a REIT or they may have a pension fund behind them and they could say to themselves, where am I going to get the best return for my money? And if I have higher interest rates in Canada, that's going to affect the way that I look at Canadian property than say a South American, a European property. So now suddenly that battle for quality means something in within those competitive marketplaces. Clearly the, the, the best properties in Canada will continue to trade, they will continue to do really well is now those fringe properties that you wonder what will happen with those with increasing interest rates. Yeah, and Richard, you 
how do you think the stress test, when you combine the stress test with the interest rates, do you, do you think it's going to have an impact on home buying, do you think? I think the impact has already been had, basically, because I think people are now taking it, you know, they're going out and shopping and talking to their mortgage brokers, and they're already making those concessions, and they're already getting pre-approved. Um, I think for us, where we find the real pressure is, um, will the house appraise for the mortgage that the buyers want? Because we have had those price increases, even in this uh, market, which has softened over the past couple of years, um, or since, uh, since the foreign buyer sales tax, the market has softened, but the prices really haven't, especially in the 416, where we have a bit of a tale of two cities, the 905, is uh, it has a lot of listings, it has a lot of opportunities. The 416, uh, the listings are scarce as hen's teeth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, supply for sure. And um, I think that's about enough. I think it's funny on interest rates, we just had someone in our company retire. She got licensed in mm -hmm. 1973, and she just laughs when we talk about interest I rates know, going uh, up. I was, yeah, licensed you know. in, I was licensed in 1980, and so I look at these, these interest rates and I go, ah. Nothing. Know. So, so you think about the question that you just mentioned, you know, interest rates are going up, it's harder to afford a house or home ownership, we have affordability issues. Vancouver solved some of these problems by having inclusionary zoning as part of the houses. So why wouldn't you pop a basement suite in your house to able, you know, enable you to afford that house better or do some other kinds mm. of density within your house? We have many opportunities available to us and I'm confident that the creativity of, of people will actually help to drive some of those solutions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I think we have to think outside the box past, sometimes Past too. two sales in, in the, wor the area that I work in and the w listings we had, one had already had a basement apartment and that made it more affordable for, for the buyer. And the second one uh, had the opportunity of putting in a basement apartment and, and that really is something that is a, is a big problem solver these days, having that extra income. No, oh, absolutely. Uh, great points. So moving on to topic three is that we're going to talk a little bit about tech disruptions and how it's caused a shift in the real estate business model. So we've we've talked quite a bit about changes in interest rate, how it's going to impact real estate, um, but let's just want to talk mm -hmm. about tech for sure. a little bit, which is that's my background and right? my favorite topic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we heard there's there's all kinds of different companies, and one thing I know, having come from a conference, they talked about the venture capital that's come right. into our business, which right. has never had this. You right. know, it, it's incredible what's what's happened. Yeah. Um, but we've heard a lot about Zillow as well in 2018. Mm -hmm. In fact, a re a Zillow participated and and sort of uh, spoke at our. Uh, we had a huge reality conference earlier this year, and they were there. So, um, Richard, beginning with you, what do? And I know everybody that knows you, and if you're listening to this, uh, Richard's always remained well abreast of technology. <laughs> yeah. And uh, what, what do these changes mean? I'm going to ask about the commercial side yeah. too, but right now f on the residential brokerages, how does it impact business, Richard? You know what? Um, there's always a shiny new toy and these are just tools and tools are only good if you use them. And so it'll be interesting to see whether the public uh, moves from Realtor.ca, which is a free and easy service that uh, you know avails them of all the listings in the uh, in Canada, to something like Zillow, which uh, you have to sign up for, you have to decide whether your company is going to be involved with it, etc. So you're not going to see all of the listings uh, right away. I know that uh, Royal LePage is not moving into uh, Zillow, um, so I think uh, you, we'll see what happens and how it how it sort of um, levels out, but. Years ago, there was a time when um, all of the listings that we had went up to Realtor.com in the United States, and um, then they sold you back um, options to, you know, buy a postal code, get get leads, and everything. There's a lot of lead generation uh, happening now, and they're selling you the leads, and oftentimes um, it's a long-term investment and. Sadly, a lot of our members are very short term in their thinking. They want, you know, they want to know if I went to an open house, did I get a buyer? Yeah. You know, 30 people yes. walk through the open house and they're probably potential buyers and sellers, but they're only concerned about that one buyer that went through. Yeah. So um, I think technology, there's always going to be changes. I mean, I love DocuSign, I love the things that that provides us. 
I love the fact that we, uh, you know, especially now with so much international, we, that we don't have to physically be there. And I think that is making, that is making a difference. We'll see what, uh, what happens with Zillow. Um, I'll, I'll reserve my judgment. Yeah, that's great. And DocuSign, that, that's a game changer. Oh. Electronic signatures yeah. and allows those of us that travel a lot. And if somebody says to you today, uh, can you just fax that to me? I go, w what? <laughs> yeah. Is that like a check? <laughs> yeah, you know? right. <laughs> so Sheila, I'd like to have you chime in on this technology conversation. Um, so everything's going to change. No matter mm -hmm. what you look at, it's changing. We're in the middle of the fourth industrial revolution right now. So to think that we're going to behave the same way in the next decade or two as we did the last two decades is is not realistic. You then layer, uh, you know, on top of that, that our real estate industry tends to be very traditional, fa fairly, um, you could say, archaic sometimes mm -hmm. in the way that we go about things. We love pounds of paper as opposed to, you know, electronic documents as an example. So. It would be much more difficult for our industry necessarily to embrace those changes. But th that wave is upon us. And so when you think about some of the disruptive technologies that will change everything that we do and how we live, work, and play, you need to pay real close attention to things like artificial intelligence, advanced manufacturing, robotics, robotics process automation, cognitive platforms, blockchain, you know, sensors. When you think about all of those things and how they play out, you know, we'll have smart buildings with sensors all through the buildings so that we can you know, have different temperatures or light control or understand who's in the building. You think about smart cities. You think about what sidewalks doing here down in Toronto on the waterfront and what mm -hmm. that looks like. All of those changes are transformational and in fact will change the way that we live, work and play. No, it's amazing, here, isn't it? Here's a bit of the scary thing about it. I, I'm very much into it. We had our house smartified. Uh, I, I call it smartified about <laughs> seven or eight years ago. But I can tell you everything is moving so fast that now it's time we really have to redo our house again because everything that we had from six or seven years ago is no longer, you know, it's no longer the, the top of the line. It's no longer all of the things that we can do. Uh, you know, we, we keep on adding things and having more and more. But there's always going to be, um, I mean, I love the fact that all of this is coming. As a matter of fact, I cannot wait to have the self-driving car, which is going to drop me off, allow me to show a property in downtown Toronto, drive around the block, mm -hmm. and then come and pick me up again. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, it's not too far away, I no. don't think. <laughs> well, actually, we're living it now. Believe yeah. it or not, many of us are living that existence now. The, the workplace that I go to every day, we have 50 5,600 people with unassigned seating. That means we don't have our own dedicated seats. We move around the building, which means that we can choose to work on our teams, which we do, or, you know, go home to work. That choice, and that home could be Niagara Falls or Muskoka or wherever else. And so suddenly that relationship between work and home becomes very dynamic and a really important consideration in the war for talent. So when you think about people you know, many of the employers looking for the brightest and best. How do you actually capture the brightest and the best, and how does real estate play into that? No, absolutely. Uh, I was just at the uh, economic summit in Niagara-on-the-Lake that the mm -hmm. Ontario Chamber mm -hmm. of Commerce put on, and it talked a lot about strength and uh, the schools and, and the, the importance of, of our education. And uh, anyway, we talked. I could keep talking on tech for, for quite a while, but I want to I move along to our fourth point, which is on a REBA review and raising professional standards and, and um, you know there are a lot of changes happening in our industry and from Maria's perspective you mentioned about the facts mm -hmm. the fax machine our legislation that governs us is from 2002 that was when faxes were techie mm -hmm. you know not anymore and and so our legislation has really really got out of date so uh, 16 years and that's a long time because you know with technology changes the price of things everything right. has changed our consumers are much smarter Things are much more complicated. So, Richard, I know you've been in the business for some time now. Yes. <clears throat> and you were in the business before we had the act in 2002. Yeah, te tech to me was a pen and uh, and uh, a piece of paper. That was about <laughs> yeah. it. No NCR, cell phones. NCR form? NCR form. Yeah, well, so no, I don't even know who's, yeah. So, so what do you think about our changing landscape? You've, you've looked at it a lens of over 20 years in the business. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, you mean as far as I, I find the business much more interesting now 
Uh, but you know, I think I think that is much more difficult. I think that's why you're seeing a lot of teams right now. I lead a team of uh, six, seven people, and everybody has a specialty on the team. We have somebody who basically just sits in the office. She's what we call an ISA, inside sales agent, and she sits in the office, and all she does is pick up the phone and call of all, all of our clients and touch base with them because the list is too large for you know we need we want to keep in touch but the business has changed and i think uh, we have to accommodate it through reba um and you know i know there's a lot of a lot of call for open opening up the offer process uh it'll be interesting to see what happens i know in australia they do auctions so you know will we have open auctions uh, in canada yeah, and those that are interested, rebareform.ca, yeah. it kind of lays out the paper that we have, and there's 37 recommendations that we made and that, that we're working through, and uh, a lot of great information. And, and uh, Sheila, I want to ask, one of the sections in the Reba Reviews is dedicated to education and the importance of education. So what are your thoughts on the importance of education and certifications in the, in the commercial community? So the answer is, of course, yes. Of course, there needs to be education. There's actually a couple of universities, certainly University of Guelph, Ryerson, UBC, that have incredible commercial real estate degrees. You know, as part of their business school, it's a special dedicate, or designation. I think that's really important. Layered on top of that, the various industry designations, the Appraisal Institute of Canada, you know, the uh, CCIM, or the Royal Institute of, Char Royal, uh, Institute of Chartered Surveyors from the UK, those designations are great for um, young people aspiring to come into the business to learn the background toward it. And then, of course, there's the ongoing education professional development that all the uh, various industry associations support and provide. No, that's, um, yeah, that education. I know I'm a Guelph grad and a friend of yeah. mine that she worked with us briefly. She went on to take that commercial program at Guelph and went to Cushman Wakefield and now works with Cadillac, yeah. Cadillac Fairview. And it, it's an impressive program. Yeah, I'm a big proponent of the CIPS course, which is a Certified International Property Specialist, because if you're dealing with uh, foreign buyers or foreign investment or even just walking the streets of downtown Toronto, you have to understand what it is that drives the buyers and the sellers. Uh, who come from other countries and want to make, you know, they want to establish here. You have to understand how they work and what, you know, what their needs are and what their what's important to them. No, is there a website for that, Richard? You know, the uh, yeah, the National program. Association of Realtors and uh, TREB, both TREB and CREA offer the course as well, and I think uh, REIC does it as well. So it's the Certified International Property Specialist, and it's great because uh, five days of uh, study and each day is in a different, uh, on a different continent, and you learn, basically, you learn a lot about what happens and how lucky we are to live in Canada and the United States because uh, we properly have a proper MLS system. And Yeah, no, yeah. absolutely we are. Yeah. And so our last topic, topic five, which we are talking about a little bit before we started today, is rental housing supply and some vacancy issues, both commercial and, and residential. And uh, there was a new report that was released by CMHC that Canada's overall vacancy rate dropped for a second year in a row as demand for rental housing grew at a faster pace than supply. And in its annual rental market survey, they said that in 2018, it was 2.4%, down from 3%. In, and in Ontario, the vacancy is at 1.8. And in Toronto, it's actually 1.1%. And 37,000 new purpose-built apartments were added across Canada this year, but demand for apartments increased by 50,000. So there isn't enough supply to keep up with the demand. So, Richard, how does this impact home ownership? Well, first of all, I will tell you it's quite surprising. Uh, in the past year, we've seen multiple offers on rentals. And as a matter of fact, we had one that had five. And I think the biggest thing is that I think you're going to see more and more people deciding to sell their house, uh, possibly to move to a rental or to keep a small rental in the city, move out to the country and do, you know, a long distance kind of living or actually just, you know, sell their property in the city and move out to the country and not come back. Um, and I think that's going to, uh, you know, home ownership to me is is wonderful, but there are, you know, homes are, uh, there's a lot that we need to be done, that need to be done with the homes and uh, upkeep, et cetera, and maintenance. And uh, I think you are going to see more of a change. People are going to start becoming more New Yorkish where they live in possibly a rental in the city and then move out to the country. 
No, Sheila, how, talk a little bit about vacancy in relation to commercial properties. I know it's been a booming market, especially around here, I know. So think about high-rise apartment buildings, right? That's where the rental product is mm -hmm. mostly. When you think about the valuations on those properties, they're down at 2 3 4% cap rates. So they're just incredible appetite for that product in the market for investors. Investors look at apartment buildings and say, this is a great place to you know, put our money to get the sustainable return. Um, and I think that, that lower vacancy rates, that, that can be solved through more supply. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it goes back yeah. to the supply conversation that we had earlier. Absolutely can be solved that way. Oh, absolutely. And supply, and that's something we we keep banging on that drum as a provincial yeah, supply is supply is the biggest thing. It's the biggest issue. It, it's, it's, uh, I don't think I've ever seen such a dearth of supply in, uh, in, the, in, the, in the real estate market. Yeah, the, well, in the fall economic statement, Vic Fidel, our, our finance minister, that they announced it would help get rid of rent control for new units across Ontario in an effort to incentivize the building of more purpose-built rental mm -hmm. apartments. So what are your thoughts on that? Do you see some merit in that? Yes, yeah, so the development community, of course, because then yeah. they'll, be, they'll say, well, we can now afford to build new units because we know that somebody will be there at the end of the day to be able to rent them at whatever value they're created at. Yeah. And, and so I think that that can help to encourage the, the development of all kinds of new property across the country. These developers, again, are very well suited to be able to bid apart, you know, build apartment buildings. We just have to give them the incentive to be able to make it happen. Yeah, yeah, they're they're business people. You have to. There has yeah. to be somewhat of a return. And there has to be there has to be some clarity on restrictions and 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 uh, you know um, how to move forward in a faster faster way. It takes years and years and years to build a building, and to get all the approvals, get everything in line, and there has to be some sort of streamlining as well as more land. No, and, and you hear, and that's one thing that this provincial government is very strong on, mm -hmm. is the, the red tape reduction. And, and they've attached a minister to that to really work yeah, on red that. Tape is, yeah. And they are really putting some exciting things forward. So it'll be nice to see uh, what happens at the end of the day. But um, any final thoughts before we wrap up here? Richard, I'll go to you, and then Sheila, and then uh, we'll call it a day. You know what? Um, it, 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 as far as being a realtor in this marketplace or in any marketplace, I absolutely love it because there's never a day that's the same. There are always different challenges. There are always different things happening. Um, I think, you know, keep, keep busy, keep active, keep engaged and watch what's happening. And I'm, and I'm feeling, I am feeling much more positive, uh, you know, with our government this year. Uh, than I was last year. I was a little bit uh, concerned about uh, some of the choices they'd made, especially around uh, the um, uh, the the foreign buyer sales tax and also the uh, you know the strengthening of the um, rent controls. Okay. So I'm I'm feeling very positive. Good. Thanks, Richard. How about you, Sheila? Ontario is a great place to live, mm -hmm. work, and play. It's a wonderful place to do business in. It's perhaps one of the better places in the world. That's why we're attracting so many new people. That's why people like Amazon said, let's mm -hmm. take a look at uh, Toronto as a marketplace. But for those of us operating in this marketplace, we have to pay real close attention to technology and how that will change the way we live, work, and play. And so looking at some of the new technologies, and I don't mean apps and mobile things, I mean actually the fundamentals. When we think about things like blockchain and we think about um, you know analytics and some of those elements that are going to change the way that we actually do things the opportunity to go and learn about them and to embrace them and you know build that in as part of your build business model and not just resort back to the paper processing that we've always yeah. done no that's great and uh, I just want to say thank you both what a, it's been exciting for me to meet you Sheila and, and it's such an impressive resume and appreciate you sharing with us some of your background and uh, your knowledge and Richard, it's always a pleasure to always see you, my friend, and uh, thank you for, for joining us here on the podcast today. So, Thank you for the opportunity. You're most welcome.